Good afternoon and welcome to Retrospect. Uh, we are going to have a really big crowd for today's uh, webinar. Um, and while everybody makes their way in and gets settled down, I wanted to take just a moment to introduce myself and the Ride On fundraising team. Um, so I'm Lindsay Jordan. I'm the CEO of Ride On and the founder of Philanthropy, which is the host of today's webinar. Uh, Ride On fundraising provides fresh fundraising solutions for high impact nonprofits through grant writing, annual funds, and capital campaign services. While Ride On is a for profit business, we actually operate not-for-profit programming through our 501c3, which is called Philanthropy. Uh, Philanthropy is the state's um, only program that offers an accelerator for nonprofit startups, which is super cool. We do fundraising education through Retrospect, like today. And we have a grant writing apprenticeship specifically for Black, Indigenous, and people of color who are interested in a career in fundraising. I'm thrilled to introduce today's presenter to you as well. Um, Megan Gaddis joined the Write On team earlier this year as we expanded into Oklahoma City and she's already made a huge difference for many of our clients. Megan has years of experience in development and community engagement through Campfire and Remerge and holds her degree in sociology from the University of Oklahoma, or excuse me, University of Central Oklahoma. Megan learned how to fundraise from some of the most notable philanthropist in Oklahoma City, so donor, donor cultivation is definitely her lane, um, and I think you're really going to enjoy today's webinar. Before we get started, one more quick introduction. Um, I also wanted to introduce Laura Orwig, who is our Development and Communications Coordinator. Uh, Laura is producing today's webinar, so if you have any audio or visual issues, you can drop your question into chat and she'll be able to help you out. Also, if you have any questions um, during the Q&A session of today's webinar, Add them over to Laura and she will uh, post them up at the end of um, end the webinar. Okay, that was a lot. And I know the reason you're here is to learn about donor cultivation. Um, so without further ado, please join me with a round of emojis for our speaker, Megan Gaddis. Let me get my slides up here. Hey, everybody. It is nice to be here with you today. Thanks for taking time out of your day to talk to me about donor cultivation. I am super excited to share with you what I've learned along the way on my journey. Um, so I'm just going to hop right in. So what is cultivation? Such a fancy word. Uh, really, it just means relationship development. Uh, people give to people. And in my experience, um, you know, I meet with people at foundations and when I talk to them, I get to know them, they get to know me and we figure out the work that we're both doing to see if it kind of jives together and if we can't work together and collaborate and serve the people that we're both interested in serving. And so if I make those relationships with the foundations, uh, then they know who I am and we can have, we can have great conversations about um, what needs to happen or if any changes need to be made or if we need to pull any collaborative partners together because um, duplicating efforts isn't, isn't a great thing to do in the nonprofit world because there's so many of us here in Oklahoma even. Uh, there's a lot of nonprofits and we all have great intentions and want to serve the people that need it. And I think that we do that better in relationship to one another so that we're not duplicating. And foundations that I've met with have the same perspective and they're very open to hearing about the work that you're doing and how you can work with some of the other people that they're working with also. So cultivation, the fancy word that we use in the fundraising world, uh, is part of a donor cycle. And so this cycle is meant to keep the relationship alive. And it starts with identification, which is finding prospects, uh, finding donors, potential donors that could help, that, that have the same interests as the work that you're doing. Um, and just finding them and reaching out to them is the cultivation stage. So once you've identified who could be a good candidate, then you want to reach out to them individually and talk to them about the work that you're doing and see if it's something that they're interested in helping with because they started a foundation for a reason and they want to help people just like you want to help people. So after cultivation, you know, that's when the ask comes in. And I know so many people that are scared of making the ask and I was too when I first got into this world and knew nothing about how to ask for money. Um, but really asking is the easy part if you've done the cultivation because you've already had the conversations up front with them about what your needs are as an organization and the needs of the people that you serve. And so they're ready for that conversation with you at that point. Um, and they have those conversations all day long uh, with 
all the people that they have relationships with and fund. So it's definitely a normal part of building those relationships with any donor um, is using this cycle. And then after the fact is stewardship, which we'll talk about later in the presentation, but that's really, you know, keeping them up to date on on what you've done with their money and how they've made an impact for the people that you've served because they want to know that's why they're there they want to help and do good in the community and and they want to hear how their support of your organization has helped those people that you serve so why is it important to cultivate so there's a couple of reasons um, cold asks or whenever you just submit an application to a donor and You've not talked to them about who you are or what you do or what your work is or who you're serving. Um, so they get an application along with, I don't know, a thousand other applications. And if they have had a relationship with you, they know you, they can, they can call you up and ask you um, questions as it relates to your application. If they already have that, have that relationship with you, if they don't, then they're less inclined to reach out and find out more about what you're doing because you didn't put in that upfront effort to, to introduce them to your organization and the mission and the people that you serve. So you're a lot more successful when you cultivate a relationship than when you just send out applications to these foundations and they don't know who you are and you don't know who they are. Um, it also helps because uh, the people that you talk to are very upfront with you about what they like to fund and who they like to help and where their focus areas are. And if you talk to them beforehand and they say that you're not a good fit, then you don't have the time, you're not wasting time on the background, uh, filling out applications or gathering the data that they might need to, to, to fund you. Um, and a lot of foundations have LOI processes, which are similar to cultivation, but still, if you don't make that connection with them personally, there's less of a chance for them to be inclined to, to learn more about what you're doing. Well, I think this is the time actually now to play our first video from one of my friends, Jenny Bass Carl. Thanks for coming on my webinar and talking to me about cultivation. I've talked a lot about just standard cultivation as it relates to relationships and fundraising, but I kind of wanted to invite you on so you could talk to me about um, what cultivation looks like in planned giving. I'm Jenny Bass Carl, and my company, my business, is Giving Well. I am a nonprofit consultant. I help nonprofits be better and do better. And one of the ways I do that is through consulting and helping them with plan giving. That's my, my true specialty. I'm a lawyer by education, and I also have my charter advisor in philanthropy. And I love plan giving. I love sustaining nonprofits and helping them get to the point where they're a little bit more financially secure, but also they have true long-term great relationships with their donors and they're able to match the donor's desire with the needs of the organization. Profits, uh, the majority, I would say, of the nonprofits I work with are startups. And so the word plan giving to them is probably not even at the forefront of what's happening with them right now. And <laughs> so I'm just curious if you could tell us a little bit about what plan giving means. Sure. So what well, plan giving is, I mean, in the most strict terms, it means you've planned your gift. You, we, how we usually define it is if you give out of your discretionary income, so like you do your annual giving fund or campaign or you have an event, those are people that are paying out of their checkbook, so to speak. You know, they make, it, they make their salary and they may decide to give some to charity, their favorite causes. A plan gift is usually given out of what are termed non-cash assets. So not discretionary income, but things like stocks and bonds or real estate, business interests, and, um, IRAs, retirement assets, even major gifts. Lots of times people have that, that money secured away separately. It's not just their daily checking you know, account. It's what it typically comes from. So they have to plan it. It takes a little bit more thought. And it's usually larger gifts and what's cool about that is the impact can be amazing. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a different type of um, conversation that happens around that. And with that comes different cultivation, I would imagine, because Absolutely. planning that goes with it. It's usually not just a nice mailer. 
that comes along. Right. <laughs> and you don't usually get too many plant gifts at a luncheon. <laughs> so it is more of a gift that comes when people have connected, really connected with your mission. And they want to make a difference to that mission. They want to have an impact. Sometimes people will call these impact gifts or investment gifts. And they're, they really are looking for something more than one and done. There's a term, checkbook philanthropy or peanut butter philanthropy, where you just kind of spread it thin and you give because your buddy called you and you've been invited to this luncheon and you get that call to action, like, okay, I got to do something. So those are very, uh, they don't have a lot of thought process with them. It doesn't mean that they mean less or they're not, they're, they're very, very essential to nonprofits being successful, but it's just different kinds. So you start at the top and you have annual giving and then you've got maybe event sponsorships. Then you have major gifts, capital gifts at the very bottom, that true foundation where you get the sustainable gifts, sustaining gifts, that's plain giving. And you think about when you also, when you think about that pyramid structures you go through, each step, you're developing a deeper relationship with your donor. So you're cultivating and engaging them more and more, and it's over a longer term. And so that's another thing to think about, Megan. When you talk about plan giving, it's not just one conversation. It's, it's a lot of conversations, and a lot of those conversations are what I call more indirect conversations. So your cultivating is not necessarily you go in with this packet and you have this exact ask out. The best, the best plan gifts happen when people self-select their gifts. You know, when they start telling you, oh, I've left your organization in my will. So that's 70% of plan gifts are gifts and wills or trust. And for some organizations, that's even more. I would assume though that somebody probably wouldn't get to that self-selection stage if there was absolutely no cultivation to begin with. <laughs> well, no, but you're right. It takes, you're cultivating them maybe for an annual gift or a major gift, but sometimes it's not linear. So you can be talking to them about annual gift and let's take the best example of a plan giver. That's a loyal donor. So this is someone who's been given to your organization for, in my, the way I define it is five or more years. So every year, year in, year out, they consistently give to you. They, they developed, that's already a type of relationship. So I think of like a season ticket holder. Yeah. And so they keep going to games and they just love you. And it's just, it's almost become, um, there's a little bit of a ritual to it. And so if you start with the loyal donor and the unique thing about loyal donors is a lot of them are not your big name donors. They're, their names aren't on plaques and on walls and on buildings. But these are people, maybe it's $50 a year. Maybe it's $150 a year. But there's something there that keeps them connected because they keep re repeating that behavior. And when you reach out to them, they will tell you the neatest stories about how much they just love your organization. And it's just a real purity to it. It's like, you know, a kid, when you talk to them, their eyes just kind of light up. And the same thing happens with loyal donors. And so then working on cultivating that loyal donor, first of all, you want to keep them as loyal donors. You want to keep them engaged. But, and one way to do that is to recognize them and to appreciate them. And you recognize them for their longevity and their consistency and their steadfastness. You're not recognizing them for the dollar amount. Because a planned gift sometimes is hundreds, if not thousands times their annual giving. So if someone gives you usually a hundred dollars a year, you could get a plain gift from them for half a million dollars. So you can see where it's not always a, a the stair step isn't, you know, sometimes it's a hockey stick. It really swings up. <laughs> when you cultivate them, I think recognizing their connection with the organization, as well as recognizing the, the longevity of, their of that connection is really, really important. So you can tell them, you know, thank you for the $35. Well, that seems a little insufficient. But you, when you say, you have been giving to us for 15 years. You really care and you've been with us since we've gone through this and we've grown here and you've witnessed this and you've been a part of this. You've helped create that. That's the kind of relationship of cultiv that's the kind of cultivation that deepens a relationship. When you connect them to the, the care you're providing or the service that you're extending or the help that you're giving somebody. That's what they care about. And you just have a conversation. 
to me, the best conversations are really with plan giving prospects, especially if, if they've been donors, is that stewardship kind of mindset. Always thinking about how awesome they are to your, your organization and how awesome they are in general. And it's talking about where'd you grow up? How long, when, when did you move there? How long have you been married to your, your spouse? Did you go to school here? Oh, tell me more about your military service. I didn't know you were a teacher. What did you teach? What was your, you just start having real people conversations. A lot of plan givers are, tend to be older. I'm talking like 50 plus, sometimes even 70 plus. I have, I have conversations with plan giving prospects that are three hours long. It is not a quick, and that's why one thing, some organizations, and especially, they need to be like this when they start off, they're very concerned with that fiscal year, be it January to December or July through June. The plan giving is not a fiscal year concept. Right. It really is. It may take years to cultivate them, and then they make the plan gift. So you're, sometimes you're talking 10, 20 years. I've had one that came to fruition in less than a year. That's actually kind of a sad thing. Um, you know, think about it. But if you're able, and the other thing with, with plan giving, I think it's important to understand. It's, it, sometimes it depends upon the person, but it's also can be very generationally significant. Is they may not be as comfortable talking about, it's one thing to talk about a hundred dollar check. It's another thing to talk about, this is my estate. This is who I am. This is everything I've built up. So you have to have uh, the confidence as well as the patience to have those kind of conversations. You don't go in there the first time and go, so how much are you worth? <laughs> Again, we have to, yeah. That's not real cool. Not going to get you <laughs> it really far. But it really is. You can make a huge difference. And let's talk about the kind of impact you want to have. Because also people with plan giving, they don't always realize that if they give you so they gave you $100,000. And if that goes into an endowment, that's $5,000 a year for forever. And then he's like, if you've been normally giving us 5,000 a year or less, all of a sudden this one gift at your passing, that's such a sustaining gift and that 5,000 funds a half of a, a teacher for this program every single year, or you know, whatever it is in your individual program's case. And when they start realizing that, they're like, oh my gosh, or it's this many flu shots, or it's this much, um, this many people fed, what, whatever your metrics are. And they start thinking like that. That's when you turn them from a donor to a philanthropist. And to me, that's, the, that's like the most successful kind of cultivation is if you can get them to think about themselves as a philanthropist. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for talking to us about cultivation as it relates to planned giving. And um, I assume we can share your information with our guests so that they can reach out to you if they want to learn more about having these scary conversations that aren't very scary. Yeah, it's not It's not scary it's to feel confident that it's not about the technical stuff. Because the people, I mean, most people don't care. And you know what, as fundraisers, that's not the, we're not the ones writing the wills or the trust or any of that. They're going to go to the professionals that know all that. We're just the ones helping them with the heart connection. So that is my friend, Jenny Bass Carl. She's taught me a lot about how to fundraise and how to have successful relationships and, and talk to people. So I'm really glad that she was on here to share that information with us. Foundations are scary. <laughs> That's supposed to say kind of, but not really. <laughs> so I know that whenever I got into fundraising originally, I thought you do what? You ask people for their money? How does that work? <laughs> I've already been scared of sales and now you want me to just ask people for money? And so it was very daunting for me to, to jump into the fundraising world, but they're people just like us. I mean, we're all humans here and I, if we don't know that by now during all of this COVID stuff, then we must be really lost at this point. But um, yeah, it's just about having those conversations that she talked about, that I talked about just a little while ago about calling them up. And you know, if you have a relationship with a funder and they 
gave you a grant for a program that you were supposed to do earlier this year and you couldn't carry out the program because of COVID, you can get on the phone to the foundation, to the person that you talk to the most and talk to them about what's going on in your foundation, I mean, in your organization, you know, and let them know, hey, we still need your support. We can't do this program, but we're shifting gears over here. Would you be okay with us? Would you be okay with backing this program? And, you know, nine times out of 10, they're gonna be okay with that. But you don't wanna not have those conversations or it's gonna, it's gonna interfere with your relationship moving forward with them. So that's why, probably why cultivation is so important is because life happens um, to all of us. And if we're communicating with our funders and we talk to them about what's really going on in the organization, um, they usually are there to have our back. They, they give us the money in the first place to make a difference. Um, and if we're open and honest with them about what's going on, then, then that's what they want to know. They want to know how they can help and how um, you can all move forward together to make the best of the, the funds that they gave you and serving the people that you serve. And so I just wanted to say that foundations are not that scary. <laughs> Donors are not that scary. They all are giving for a reason. And having candid conversations with them is the best way to, to maintain, to engage and maintain relationships with them. So collaboration. Uh, collaboration is a big deal because we talked about duplicated efforts and we talked about how many nonprofits there are in, in Oklahoma City. And the best things that I've gotten out of having conversations with foundations is telling them what I'm struggling with in the organization and what we're trying to do to serve our clients. And them being like, oh my gosh, did you know this organization over here is actually doing something similar to that? So maybe you guys can partner to serve your clients better and they can provide transportation while you provide X, Y, and Z. Um, so nothing bad has ever come from these brainstorming sessions with funders about how to collaborate or how to problem solve and how to move past things to better serve the people that you're serving. And then there's program and mission alignment that comes out of these conversations. You know, there's you have a conversation with the funder and they're like, I love the work that you're doing. It's, it's great work and it's necessary, but we have two focus areas and there are these over here. So that's not really in our wheelhouse. Um, maybe if you guys do, if you do something that pertains to those in the future, we'd be interested in talking to you. But right now it's just not, it's just not in our wheelhouse. And um, those conversations, like I said earlier, save time and Everybody is on the same page. They talk about what's going on in the organization. So that's the same thing as the, the focus and the funding alignment. You know, does what you're doing to serve the people in the community match what the foundation originally set out to do when they decided they wanted to support the community by providing money to, to nonprofits? And then there's benefits of the relationship after the grant. So you've done, this is kind of like that, going back to that cycle. Um, you know, you've had an open conversation. They've gotten to know you. You've gotten to know them. They know what you wanted to do with the money that they gave you for the grant. And actually turned out to work like this. You know, how can we continue to work together to serve the people that, that you're interested in supporting? And so it's not... It's really just about having conversations, you know? Um, and we're lucky enough, I'm gonna have Laura share the video. I had my friend, there's a helicopter by my house. <laughs> I had my friend, Jessica Gilmore from Express Professional Employment. She is a philanthropic liaison. And so she helps decide, she helps work with the trustee funding. And so she's the person that you wanna have that relationship with where you're talking to them about what you're doing. and so. I'm excited to hear what, what she shared with me whenever we met. Certainly. My name is Jessica Gilmore. I am the philanthropic liaison for Express Employment International. We are a corporate funder. So I oversee everything from application to award in regards to awarding grants to nonprofit partners within the Oklahoma City metro area. So I've spoken a lot about cultivation from the perspective of nonprofit organizations, but I want to hear from you about the importance of relationship building from a funder's perspective. Certainly. I think relationships are key. 
between the funder and the grantee, primarily because it makes the hard conversations a lot easier going forward. It also opens up dialogue to other aspects that one might not necessarily think of. I love conversations with nonprofit partners on a personal level in that relationship aspect because then when I go back, I've got something to refer to from a previous conversation like, hey, your son was sick last time we talked. How are they doing? Or, you know, some type of personal level asking about one's fur babies, asking about one's career, how changes are going, if maybe they've experienced a transition with a new executive director, how that looks. So both personal and professional, there's those little notes there that make them know you're, you've listened. And that's very key in relationships. Another important aspect to relationship building is that you can identify other sources of need for the organization, maybe ones that you can provide as in-kind services or donations or volunteers, as well as identifying a need that maybe you can't provide, but you know another funder or another organization that can, and partnering, making that introduction, expanding their network, I think goes a really long way. So relationships are key to identifying all of those aspects. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about why collaboration is so important in the nonprofit world. You talked about connecting nonprofits with mm -hmm. other nonprofits. Collaborations are key because you can do so much more with so little, if that makes sense. We really stress as funders and as a sector as a whole that nonprofits really shouldn't go outside of their mission statement. However, if they identify a need that they can contribute to, but maybe on a small scale, if they're able to collaborate with other nonprofit organizations that maybe that aspect is part of their mission and they can combine and, and use those services together, you have a greater good. You're not going outside of your mission, you're staying within that. Sometimes you get granted a little extra. A really good example here in Oklahoma City is a combination between four different organizations, the West Welker Foundation, Cleats for Kids, PAL, which is the Police Athletic League, and then Fields and Futures. They all come together to support one school at a time, but in different ways. One builds the field for athletics, the other provides the equipment, the third provides the specialty shoes and cleats and socks, and the fourth one provides the coaches. All of these things work together, staying within their own mission to provide one larger, greater, good, amazing thing for a school that not only impacts the students of that school by keeping them in school, keeping them active and engaged and keeping their grades up, it provides mentors. They take that home with them. They share that with siblings, they share that with parents. That's something that will stay with them as adults. And I think it's a fantastic, or, pardon me, a fantastic example of four nonprofit organizations coming together in a collaboration to do something greater. That is so awesome. I didn't know that we, I, did, I knew about Fields and Futures, but I didn't mm -hmm. know that they um, came together like that. That makes Absolutely. so much sense when somebody really takes care of what their specialty is and what they're really designed to do. And then they partner mm -hmm. with somebody else to make it even better. That's yeah. Cause what good is a new athletic field if you don't have the equipment or the coaches to go with it? Right. Yep. I was thinking about how, um, I try to talk about how important collaboration is with some of the people that I work with. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes the first thing is kind of scary when they hear about collaboration and um, it doesn't have to be scary though. I think that, right. I think that there's a lot of people that are anti-collaboration because they just don't see the benefits to it. I think another great example, and in this case, I won't name the organizations, but there was a food pantry that you know provided just that food services to families primarily single moms and those moms would come in and shop the food pantry and they'd have their kids with them and the kids would need something to do or whatever and so volunteers and members of this food pantry said you know we really need to 
offer maybe some after school help, some tutoring, some homework help for these kids while their moms shop. But that was outside of their mission and their board of directors made the good but tough call to say, no, we can't expand our services outside of our mission. Timing was great because there was an after school organization that provided homework and tutoring help and their school was one of the ones cut in the Oklahoma City downsizing of public schools and they needed a new place to set up shop and, and help and through networking, through collaboration, they partnered with this food pantry. The food pantry said, we have space if you can provide the service. Again, an example where two organizations didn't go outside of their mission, collaborated to provide services and meet the need and are still thriving today. Parents can leave their kids in the after school help program while they go shop for food in the food pantry. It's a win-win. That is so awesome. It seems like when collaboration happens, many more needs can get met and met effectively rather than whenever there's mission creep. Exactly. Quality lacks because mm -hmm. you're not sticking to the thing that you're great at. Yes. Let's talk about how cultivation looks in terms of what does it look like if you get somebody who submits an application to you that you've never heard of, nobody's ever made contact with you or invited you into their organization to learn more about what they do versus if they have? Well, the first thing that tells me is they didn't read the application because we do have a summary at the top of our application when they're getting ready to fill it out that says, if you're a first time applicant, please email or call. Let's have a conversation first. So that, you know, as a funder, I look at that and I go, oh, well, they, they didn't read directions. They didn't follow directions. Um, that's not necessarily like a, a check mark. They're not blacklisted or anything, but that kind of sets the tone in that uh, regard. If they don't, if, if they haven't reached out to us before and I'm not familiar with them, then I do my research. I have a network of colleagues at other foundations and organizations I'll call and say, hey, have you heard of them before? Have you worked with them? What was your experience? Sometimes it's looking them up on GuideStar or Candid. Um, oftentimes, because some of the questions we ask on our application is, you know, when were you awarded your EIN, which is your tax ID, and so forth. Sometimes I'll go as far as going to the IRS database to research them and see because oftentimes they are brand spanking new startup. Other times I will call and follow up, but usually not. We don't solicit applications. So unless there's a question with their application, I'll, I'll leave it alone. I mean, I'll do my due diligence on my end with within my network of colleagues. Um, but typically I'll just, I'll let it ride to see what my committee thinks when they're reviewing the application itself. And for somebody who has established a relationship with you, is it more like then you have, you know them and what's that kind of like when you go to the committee, if the committee has questions versus somebody who you don't know? Sure, the nice thing about having a relationship is it's, it's typically a working relationship. We have funded them before or we've at least gotten to know them and see firsthand what they're doing. Maybe we've identified through a site visit other ways that we can help, other resources that we might be able to offer in addition to funding or in lieu of funding. So it makes it a lot easier. Oftentimes, because of that relationship, the development director feels comfortable enough to call up and say, hey, we're getting ready to fill out our application. This is kind of what we're thinking. Can you guide me through this process? Are we on the right track for what we're asking? Is this a good dollar amount? Should it be more? Should it be less? Um, we have some organizations that will be asking us for multiple events throughout the year. And so they wanna know, do they need to fill out a separate application for each event? Or can they fill out one large overall annual corporate sponsorship with all of those items included in it? So I think that goes back to if the relationship's a good one, it makes those hard conversations easy and you're able to guide them through the application process to ensure that when your committee gets a hold of it for evaluation, there's not a lot of questions that you can't answer for them. 
That's awesome. I love that. I think that's one of the things that I try to help um, the people that I work with understand is that it's it's best just to have a conversation about what you Absolutely. need help with and and what the funder's interest is and and where those might align or where they might not align and and just have a candid conversation mm -hmm. about where the two of you might be able to connect because I know that most people like you have great ideas for how to how to help organizations in other ways than just monetary and so it starts with a conversation and I think that's why cultivation is so important. Well, and I'll tell any room full of nonprofits, development directors, grant writers, whoever, make the phone call. I mean, the phone call is going to be so much better than you anticipate. Don't fear the phone call. But if you encounter an organization that won't give you five minutes by phone or at least set up time to speak with you by phone, you probably don't want to be doing business with them anyway. If they don't want to take time to guide you through the process and give you a full understanding of of how they award grants um why waste your time so we talked like what she was just mentioning was the collaboration piece where she could identify needs you know she is a funder she works with several nonprofits and she has relationships with those nonprofits and knows the work that they're doing in the community Whereas when you're in a nonprofit, you're pretty much focused on what you're doing because you wear so many hats, you don't have the time to do anything else but to keep the fires out and to try to raise the money. And so at the forefront of your mind is not collaboration. And when you have that engagement with somebody that's a funder who has all these other relationships, they have resources in their back pocket to point you to, to say, you know, I know this person, they're doing a really great job doing this. Just kind of what we mentioned earlier with collaboration, she kind of reinforced that from her perspective as being somebody who, who works with several nonprofits and knows what's happening on the ground. And she also <laughs> talked about what it means to have a cold versus a warm ask. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, she, she said that I, if I have a question about your application and I know you, then I'll just pick up the phone and call you and ask you about it. Um, and then she's the one that's in the meeting with the trustees who are asking all of the questions about what this program is and why they should fund it. And so she's basically your advocate there, you know, and, and she cares about the work that you're doing just as much as you do. So she will call and make sure that she has all the information that she needs to be able to represent you adequately during those meetings. Here's the fun part. So it's basically the same exact thing, except you get to tell them, I like stewardship better because then you get to tell them all the great things that they were able to accomplish by supporting your organization. Um, you know, how many millions of dollars did you save the state by keeping women out of prison? You know, um, you get to tie back the outcomes that you have in your organization to those people who supported you and gave you the funds to make that happen. Um, and that's why they wanted to do that in the first place, to make those changes. And so stewardship is a very big piece in the whole cycle, is making sure that they know that you carried out the work that you said you were going to do, and you know you impacted X, Y, and Z, and, and that you couldn't have done it without them. And so, and that's, um, there's a lot of aspects to stewardship. And so I kind of asked Lindsay to hop on in here and tell us some aspects of what stewardship could look like. Um, so yeah, I'm going to hand it over here. Yeah, am I I'm always muted? Oh, good. I'm finally not muted. Hooray. Yeah, so um, I like the slides show here. It's good to have a plan of standardized activities that you can do for donors, but just like cultivation, customizing these activities um, to what you know a donor is going to respond best to is always the best strategy. So, for example, many donors like foundations will tell you that they really don't want your swag. And it's not because they don't think that that painting that Bobby Sue did with her thumbs on the back of a coffee filter is not like the most creative thing ever. It's that they literally don't have room for all your stuff. Um, so what I think is, what I like in some of the most authentic stewardship that I've seen are activities that A, are experiential. That means donors actually taking part in the stewardship activity. 
B, have a clear connection back to the mission of the organization, and C, inspire a sense of curiosity about what the next gift could possibly be. Um, we have one client, for example, whose mission is around food scarcity. And one of the things that they do um, as a revenue stream is that they have a, a catering program. So donors who are interested in food scarcity also tend to be interested in food, like period. <laughs> So a really meaningful stewardship activity for these folks is maybe once a quarter to um, invite donors in to come harvest the produce and prepare a meal for the clients and then to have a meal together because as we know, all of these donors know each other. So that's a really fun thing for them. Um, I've seen arts organizations who have like a singing telegram for their donors, thank them for or to celebrate their birthday or to thank them for maybe like the anniversary of their first gift or something like that. Um, I've seen or environmental organizations that will send out seed packets from trees that they recently planted so that donors can have a piece of that mission in their yard. Um, and even like equine, um, equine nonprofits that would host a one day a seminar on horsemanship for donors and their families. So there's a lot of really unique experiential things that you can do. The key there again is um, that the donor is participating actively in whatever that stewardship activity is, that the activity reinforces what the donor already knows about your organization, and that it inspires that curiosity. It makes them think about, oh, I made this gift over here, but wow, I didn't know they did this other thing. Maybe next time I'll be thinking about a gift over here. Um, so those are kind of some of the bigger pieces of experiential stewardship, um, which is, again, just a continuation of cultivation. It's just what happens after the gift is made. Um, I think that organizations that have the toughest time with stewardship, Megan, you and I have talked about this, um, are actually social service nonprofit organizations. Um, it's important that these organizations respect the privacy and dignity of the people that they serve. And that makes it a little harder, right, for um, donors to engage in the actual work of the organization. So there are two tactics that I've seen that I really like for social service organizations who want to provide this level of stewardship. And the first is to focus your activities on the relationship between the donor and a specific person who's really close to the work that's being done, like a program director or like a really long time staff member. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what about the CEO? What about the executive director? Of course, your CEO and your executive director should also have strong relationships with your donors. But experiential stewardship, if you remember, is about creating access points to something that you typically wouldn't get, which is why a special conversation with a program director or with a staff member, they are, most donors do not have the um, capacity or access to develop relationships with people who are really on the front lines doing the mission. So does your program director and the donor share a favorite pizza spot? Do they love the same sports team? Do they drink the same coffee? See if you can find organic overlap between those relationships and then work to create experiences that build deeper relationships with your staff. The second tactic is more about leveraging the assets that you already have within your organization. For example, you can, um, I mean, everybody's seen this, right? But it's really effective. You can create a video on your phone for a specific donor. So we've all seen the like general, we love our donors, thank you videos. I'm talking about taking your phone, going around to the staff saying, hey, today we're gonna thank Bill, and recording a show video of everybody saying thank you, Bill. This is your impact, this is what's happening, you're awesome. Um, and then blast that out, your social media, right? Your newsletter, website, really just about any communication vehicle that you're using is a platform for you to now talk about Bill. A general thank you video is always nice, but a targeted donor thank you that's blasted out to your entire universe um, is something that is very meaningful and very personal and simultaneously does not infringe on the privacy and dignity of your clients. That's all I've got on, on stewardship. Do you have questions for me, Megan?
Uh, I love what you said. And I realized as you were talking that I kind of left out a crucial piece in this and it's volunteers um, because they're part of those people that you also want to cultivate. Um, can you remind me of the statistic of how many volunteers turn into donors? Um, over, it was at like 76%. I think it's now up to 80%. It just keeps getting higher and higher. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that we don't forget that our volunteers are also donors because one, they're giving you your time, which is a big deal. And then they eventually turn into financial supporters. And then that leads down to, you know, the planned giving route. So it all ties into the cultivation and how you have relationships with those who are interested in supporting your your organization. Um, now I think it's time for questions, which is exciting. Because <laughs> I well, talked a lot at you guys and you might have some. <laughs> it looks like Laura's been getting some. So Laura, why don't you go ahead? And if you're thinking of questions now, go ahead and drop them into the box. Laura, why don't you go ahead and um, go through a question. Yeah, so we have one from Ren uh, talking about that donor consent video. Uh, should an organization get donors consent before making such a video and sharing everywhere? You want to answer that one, Lindsay? Yeah, so I don't think that you have to get the donor's consent to make the video because if you don't blast it out to everybody, you can just send it to the donor and then it's still really meaningful. I would suggest you get their permission before you blast it out to like the newsletter and such, right? Um, I see where you're going with that. And yeah, we have some donors who are, who are very personal and who want to keep their gift private. And obviously we want to respect that. Um, but I don't think you need their permission just to do the video and send it to just them. It's still kind of, you get the same impact without a mass communication of everything. Good question. Yeah, and I think sending it out to them and telling them how thankful you are and that you would love to share it with the world, you know, is a great entry point into getting that consent. <laughs> so uh, if anyone does have any more questions at this time, it would be a great time to drop them in the chat. Is there anything else, Megan, that you would like to touch on while we're waiting for some questions? Hmm, that's a good question. I have a question for our for the folks who joined us today. Um, I would be interested to know, you know, this is kind of a one-way street, and Megan has done a really good job in providing all this information. I'd love to know what you guys wanted to learn about today, um, and maybe that will spark some of our questions. Were there something specific that you really wanted to learn more about today? And you can you can drop it in a chat or whatever you want. I also just want to point out that this is not this is something that you have to learn and you have to teach yourself and you have to be patient. You have to be willing to try and get things wrong and then try it again because relationships are hard in general with human beings. Um, and it wasn't my natural instinct to just call people and have conversations about what's going on in my program. But I noticed that the more I did it and put myself out there to have those conversations, the more confident and comfortable that I've become. And so, um, it is scary, it is different, it's a new language that I had to learn, but I know that practice makes it easier and don't be afraid to put yourself out there because they're people too and they understand what you have going on. We have a good question from Ellen. Uh, if Megan and Lindsay could kind of role play an initial call to a foundation. Thank you, Ellen, I love that. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Okay, yes, of course. Megan, do you want to be the foundation or do you want to be the nonprofit? I'll be the nonprofit. Okay. Um, so, so just to clarify, was Ellen's question, is this like a first time call? Like what is it specifically that we're, are we just, call, is this a cultivation call? I think it's probably a cold Call to introduce ourselves. So I'd start out by emailing you and being like, hey, Lindsay, uh, my name's Megan. I'm with Red on Fundraising or Organization. Um, I know that you guys like XYZ, and I'd love to have 15 minutes of your time just to share with you the work that we're doing and see what you think about it. And Sounds so good. I usually start out like an email, um, which ends up being a phone call, which we can role play the phone call. Let's do it. All right. Ring, ring. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lindsay from the Jordan Foundation. 
Hey, Lindsay, my name is Megan. I'm with Right on Fundraising. Um, I'm so glad you took the time to talk with me today. I really just wanted to share with you briefly the work that we're doing and seeing if any of it made any sense to the missions that you support and see if we can't um, work together and see what happens. Um, we XYZ, this is our mission. <laughs> and right now we're really focused on this. Um, and so these are our current needs. So um, it's interesting that you mention X program. That's something that's been a big focus for us this year. Can you talk to me a little bit about your experience thus far? Like what clients are telling you, what some of your outcomes have looked like in that space? Yeah, so it's been great. We've been able to serve, you know, 55 women in the last year and um, we've kept these women out of prison. And, and because of that, we've saved the state millions of dollars and and those women are successful living their lives and, and engaged with their family. And, and it's been a great program. Um, there are areas that we're, we're improving upon as we learn and as we grow and develop, but uh, we have some pretty great outcomes happening with that program. And we have some supporters who are interested in seeing, seeing that work continue. Who are your other supporters? Yeah, so we have In As Much Foundation and Sarkis Foundation. Um, they're really behind the work that we do, um, and they've been very helpful and, and open in communicating during this process, and they've been great supporters. Well, that sounds really interesting. To tell you just a little bit about our foundation, we focus on X, Y, and Z. Um, our recent strategic plan came out, and we're really trying to tackle this issue right here. Um, one of your programs, this one over here that you talked about, seems like it might be a fit. Um, I think it might be worth having a further conversation just to learn a little bit more about you and the organization. Um, would you be interested in coming in and just talking a little bit more about this program? Yeah, I would love to be able to do that. I can't wait to share more with you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. <laughs> All right, uh, Ren asks, can you give any updates on the state of giving on uh, national and local trends based on coronavirus issues? I'm gonna let you take that one, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another great question, Ren, thank you. Um, so there's a couple things happening, and um, let me say this. When coronavirus started, I fully expected that we were gonna see the bubble that's been happening in foundation giving pop. We've had, 10 really fantastic years of private foundation growth. It's the only area of philanthropy that has seen um, sustained, continuous, increased giving every single year since 2008. And when coronavirus started, I thought, all right, we've been waiting for this bubble to pop and here it is. Well, that has not at all happened, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm really glad Megan focused on cultivating foundations today. Foundations have continued their commitment, um, although some of them have, of course, changed their giving guidelines. In the state of Oklahoma, uh, we actually put together a guide um, to tell everybody, it's, it's not just for our clients, it's for everybody, it's on our website, um, which foundations have changed their giving guidelines, who has uh, maintained their commitment to general operating, um, and we have not seen tremendous amount of change. We have seen some foundations set up funds specifically to deal with COVID, but it has not detracted from the general operating gifts that they've been giving. Um, and we've actually seen some respond to the COVID-19 crisis and then turn around and also respond to social justice issues that are on the top of a lot of foundations' minds right now. So foundation giving is strong, um, and it's an area that I am definitely recommending to all of our clients that they spend a lot of time in right now cultivating, stewarding, um, really standing by the side of your foundation donors. Um, from an individual perspective, so there's, when people talk about individual giving, kind of talk about it with this big, wide brush stroke, and it's far more nuanced than that. Um, so what we know about individual giving right now is that it's nose diving. It's absolutely plummeting. Those are individual gifts I'm gonna say of under $500. Um, we are at a historical low uh, with individual giving. We got there really quickly and um, we have not seen the bottom of it yet. But individuals who are high net worth donors, we've seen increased giving from them in the way that we've seen increased giving from foundations. So when you're talking about your individual giving program, I encourage you to 
think about that program in a nuanced way and to really kind of start creating some segments and tiers between those donors because it's probable that people on the top of your individual giving spectrum um, are not behaving the same way as the folks who are giving um, gifts of, you know, a couple hundred dollars. And then the final area with corporate giving, um, corporations have taken a big hit. Um, we've also not seen the bottom of that. If you have a program that is very reliant on corporate giving, now is the time to start diversifying your portfolio um, because I don't think that we're going to see corporate giving, even if the economy turns around, jumps back, everything's in great shape. We all know that philanthropy trends um, a year or two behind the actual market. So even if things were to turn around in 2021, we would not see the benefits of that until probably 2022 at the earliest. Um, so that's the area I think that is actually the most tenuous right now. I know that's a really long answer, but it's a great question. Thanks, Ren. All right, and then uh, what are your best tips and suggestions for finding and cultivating brand new donors? Yeah, so um, with the work that I do here at Ride On Fundraising, I mean, we use different software to find prospects for our clients. Um, and that can be different things from Foundation Directory Online to GuideStar to, there's different things that you can do to find the prospects. Um, and there's different softwares that you can use. And then kind of like the role-playing conversation that I had with Lindsay is really what I do with anybody that's new that I don't know. Um, and I encourage my clients to have those relationships with the donor instead of it being from me because the donor wants to know the person who's doing the work. And so it's really once you find a foundation online, which you can even use Google to you know, find grant opportunities, once you find the foundation, it's really doing your research and figuring out who you need to talk to. Or even if you just find a phone number, you can call them and talk to them and say, hey, I found your foundation. I'm doing this work. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Um, yeah, it's really just putting yourself out there to have those conversations and being OK whenever it doesn't align or they don't have the capacity or it's not a good fit or, you know, fundraising is hard because there's a bunch of no's and some yeses. And I think that you just have to be comfortable and be okay with that when you're, when you're making these, um, identifying these prospects and making these phone calls and figuring out, you know, the different relationships that you can get to, to, to fund the work that you're doing. And with that, uh, what if the foundations are by invitation only? How can you get an invite with that? So those are the best best foundations to cultivate. They're invitation only because they want the relationship. So they don't have an open application for you. They don't want cold applications, you know, being sent in from people that they don't know because they're very, very relationship driven. I would say all of them are, but those that don't, that are invitation only are definitely focused on their focus areas and the relationships that they have currently. Um, but even if they are invitation only, they still will give you 15 minutes of their time to talk about what you have going on to see if it's a good fit. Just because it's invitation only does not mean that, that you can't apply to them and that they're in their own silo looking for people to fund by any means. It, it just means they wanna have that relationship with you. And if I could jump in there, so one of the things that obviously we deal with a lot of foundations that don't accept um, unsolicited asks. So we start with foundation directory. We go to um, the trustees list. We make a list of the trustees, and then the first thing we're going to do is ask the nonprofit to put that list in front of their board of directors and see if anybody knows those trustees. Um, look for as many organic connections that, as you can find, and if nobody on the board knows any of those trustees, don't stop there, right? Everybody here has a network. Um, chances are that foundation is buddies with another foundation who doesn't have any problem taking an unsolicited ask. All those people up on the phone and say, hey, we, we really think we'd be a fit for this foundation. I don't know anybody on the board. You really like us. Uh, is that an introduction you could make for us? Foundations love to be asked for things that are not money. And so those unsolicited help with those unsolicited asks um, is something that they really like to help out with. Okay, and then we have from uh, Madeline Martin uh, in a time it's so easy to ghost an organization via email. Is there another way other than emailing that could allow for cold calling? Any creative advice beyond the typical email intro? You want to take a shot at that one, Lindsay? So 
want to make sure I understand Maddie's question. The question is, is there another way for that first conversation other than email? Is that the question? I believe so, unless she wants okay. to clarify more. Oh, yes. Okay, good. She says yes. <laughs> um, this is where you get into kind of the fun part of fundraising that can seem a little bit creepy. But, um, it's part of the job. Um, yes, absolutely. It's not hard to figure out what top donors are interested in because typically they've given to a bunch of different things around town. If there's somebody you really want to talk to and you can't get an email back from them, not too super hard to figure out what they're going to be attending. Usually they're alumni of somewhere or they're part of another board or they're known for supporting another organization so they're going to be at that event. Go to them. Go to them or shake their hand, introduce yourself, um, be very gracious, say I know uh, I've sent you a couple emails but I know you're super busy. I just wanted to say hi, it's great to meet you. Um, if, there was a best way for me to get in contact with you if I thought that we were a fit. Can you share with me what that would be? And then they'll probably tell you to email them again. Um, but then they know who you are and you can follow up from that in-person interaction. Um, and I know that's kind of sleuthy, but honestly, if somebody's ghosting you and won't talk to you and you really want to talk to them, there's nothing wrong with tracking them down. <laughs> I love that answer. All right, we have <clears throat> from Ren. Sorry, what are the most important questions we should ask when considering hiring a consultant firm to help with our orgs with fundraising? Good question, Ren. So what are the most important questions to ask in hiring a fundraising consultant? Is that correct? Yes. Um, I'm gonna think on that a second because it's a really good question. Megan, do you have anything off the top of your head? No, that is a good question. <laughs> we can ask a lot of different questions. Um, I'll tell you the ones that we get most frequently, and I'll tell you um, my some of my favorite questions. Um, I get ten emails a day from a firm that says want to help. Yeah, I get that. Um, so first of all, I don't personally feel like an organization's ability to help a nonprofit is helped or harmed by their experience helping other organizations like you. So for example, if you're looking for a firm and you're an education nonprofit, I would not expect that only firms that have worked with a bunch of education nonprofits are gonna be the best fit for you. Because what that means is they might be adhering to a bunch of best practices and they're not as innovative as they could be because they've you know, fallen into this little mold. So I tend to like firms, and obviously we are a firm, so I'm biased. Um, I like firms that are general and that, um, have a mo more diverse um, client offering because it typically means that they have different lenses that they can look through and different skill sets that they bring to the table. So the first thing I'm going to look for is diversity in clients um, and the type of campaigns that they've worked on. Cost is always a big deal. There are so many different ways that consulting firms charge. Um, we charge, um, so we're a CFRE organization, which means we don't take a cut of anything that we raise ever. A lot of organizations do, and we've had some clients really push back on us and say, that's not the right fit for us. We need somebody who's going to take a percentage um, because we don't have the money up front that we're going to be able to invest in this. So I think knowing your budget and knowing what you need is really, really important as well. And then the last question that we get asked that always makes me laugh. Um, it's, not a, it's not that it's a bad question. It's, the answer is funny. Um, we are asked frequently, what our conversion rate is for grants. And it always makes me chuckle because usually folks that ask that question, have talked to a grant writer at some point along the road who has told them, well, I close 90% of my grant. I win 100% of everything I write. Well, what that tells me is that you're only writing things that you think you're gonna win. So I would be cautious of any firm or grant writer that says they're closing 100% of everything anything because you shouldn't be right if you're really out there in the field you're really working with donors you're gonna get told no <laughs> probably frequently so it's more about 
how often do you reach your client's fundraising goal? Not how many of the things do you win? How many goals do you actually succeed in? How many new donors do you bring to the table? I think those are really good questions to ask people as well as making sure the money fits and making sure they're, they're a diverse and equitable firm. Okay, and it looks like the last question is, if you are a small nonprofit and you wanna purchase a subscription to a fundraising uh, prospect search database, what do you recommend? Good question, there's a lot. I've also heard though that you can use your library card to access foundation directory online. So I don't know what that looks like in the time of COVID, um, but I do know that public libraries have access to those databases that you could you could pop in there and, and borrow from. I'm trying to think of, so obviously you can look up foundations through foundation search. For individual donors, new donor acquisition is a little trickier. Um, universities tend to do a pretty good job with their prospect research. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the credit card. I know this isn't, again, it sounds really weird, um, but you can actually purchase credit card information um, that will tell you lots of things about different donors. And if you are, if you are a brand new organization or if you are an organization without a new donor acquisition strategy, that is to say a special event that's going to bring, bring in new donors or something like that. Um, and sometimes purchasing those lists because they give you a lot of data and information about high net worth individuals can be worth it. But again, just because someone has money does not mean that they're going to make a gift to you, right? They have to have a personal connection to your organization. So um, foundations are a little bit easier because there's so many services. Foundation directly online is going to be our favorite, but it's also the most expensive. Good question. Uh, we have like one minute left. Megan, you want to take one more question before we sign off for today? Uh, sure. Well, I think I'm out of questions for now, unless anyone else wants to pop in on here. Well, perfect timing. I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to hang out with us and learn about what cultivation means and how to have those relationships that can sometimes be tricky or feel daunting, but they don't have to be that way. You know, you just have to put yourself out there and try to have those hard conversations until they become second nature for you. Well, thank you, Megan, for presenting today. You did a wonderful job, lots of really, really good information. Uh, if anybody has any other um, questions or just things that you wanna know, uh, Megan is around in Oklahoma City. We have a Tulsa team as well. You've got her information there on the screen and we're always happy to help. So uh, thank you again for joining us today and have a great rest of your week and we look forward to seeing you all again soon.